Welcome to this episode of Mentors at Your Benchside, the podcast giving you advice, tips and tools for getting the most out of your research. I'm Laura Grassi, and today I'll be talking to you about cell passage number, what it means, and why it can be misleading. Are you not sure what we mean by cell passage number? Confused about how to calculate it and keep track of your culture's passage number? Or perhaps you're wondering if there's a maximum number of passages you should perform? We've got answers to all these and more. What do we mean by cell passage? Cultured cells, if provided adequate space, nutrients, and environmental conditions, will grow logarithmically. However, they reach a point where space becomes limiting, and if no intervention is taken, cell growth will slow and cells will begin to die. This is why you need to check the confluency of your cells regularly, and once they reach about 80% confluency, you need to split or subculture the cells. This is also known as passaging your cells. So what is a cell passage number? Cell passage number is simply a calculation of the number of times you have split or passage your cells. Each time you go through that process, you should increase the passage number by one. Passage numbers are usually written on the flasks or plates of cells in incubators and on cryovials when cells are frozen down. This provides a simple and easy way to keep track of passage numbers. But why do we need to monitor and record cell passage number? Immortalized cell lines, including HeLa, HEC293, and U2OS cells, are often characterized by genetic instability, making them prone to changes over time. In addition, culture conditions may offer selective pressures that result in a change to the population of cells over time. For example, fast growing cells will outcompete slower growing cells. Therefore, the composition of cells at lower cell passage number may have very different properties and behaviors to those at higher passage cells. Primary cells tend to be much more genetically stable than immortalized cells. However, they often undergo senescence after a certain number of cell passages and can still be impacted by selection pressures. Changes brought about through genetic instability or selection pressures may result in phenotypic changes and affect how cells respond to treatments or experimental conditions. This could impact the accuracy and reproducibility of your results. Recording the passage number allows you to keep track of the age of the cells, and it is advisable to retire cells after a defined number of passages to keep your experiments reliable. It's also recommended to keep a record of the passage number of cells when you perform any experiments, as this allows you to consider the passage number if there are any anomalies in your results. What is the maximum passage number for cells? Determining the maximum passage number for cells is akin to asking how long is a piece of string. In terms of how long you can theoretically passage cells, that depends on the cell line. Immortalized cell lines can, in theory, be passaged indefinitely. However, as we discussed previously, they may experience phenotypic and population changes due to genetic instability and selection pressures over time. Practically speaking, cell passages should be limited to prevent population and genetic drift, and ideally experiments performed with similar passage numbers. There is no defined maximum number of passages you should perform for a cell line but it's highly recommended to keep passage numbers low. What is meant by low, however, can be varied, with some recommendations suggesting cell passage numbers be limited to no more than 10 to 20 passages, or there are general guidelines in the healthcare and pharmaceutical settings that passages should be limited to a maximum of five. There are a few common questions that crop up when discussing cell passage numbers. Number one, what passage number should I start at? So you have a new culture, either from a frozen stock or a supplier like ATCC, or from a fellow lab. Do you reset the clock and label your first passage one, or maybe you start at zero? No matter where you source your stock cells from, the cells you purchase have likely already undergone several passages. Suppliers should inform you of the passage number of the stocks you are purchasing, and you may find you need to pay a premium for stocks with passage numbers of two or less. If you are retrieving cell stocks from your lab's frozen supply, or have cells donated from another lab, you should ensure you ask for the passage number of the cells. You should then continue the passage number from this supplied passage number. Note that the process of recovering cells into culture from stock does not count as a passage. If the stock you are supplied with have a passage number of two, the passage number you would write on the flask you initially grow them into would also be two. Only when you then subsequently subculture them would you increase the passage number to three. But what if you are freezing your cells for yourself and then thawing? Does the process of freezing and thawing cells count as a passage? Say you have a stock plate of cells that you want to freeze down for later use that have a passage number of four. 
For adherent cells, you would need to trypsonize or detach the cells in some manner from the plate before preparing the cells to be frozen. This step is a subculturing step, meaning that the passage number of the frozen stocks should be increased by 1 to 5. That means you would write on the vials that P equals 5 for these stocks. You would not need to increase the number when you first recover the cells, only when you subsequently passage them. How can you maintain low passage numbers? There are several practices you can do to ensure you are working with low passage numbers. The first is to buy your stocks from a reputable cell source such as ATCC. Buying stocks from questionable suppliers or getting them from other labs mean you may not have reliable passage numbers because of variation in the freezing and subculturing protocols and how passage numbers are assigned. You can also freeze stocks early on. When you get and recover your stocks, you should passage them and then freeze stocks from this first round of passaging. This provides you with a set of low passage number stocks to return to when your working stocks reach the upper passage limit. After spending all the time above telling you about how passage numbers work and how to use them, it's time to point out a big problem with passage numbers. The purpose of recording passage numbers is to keep track of the age of your cultures. However, passage numbers are not necessarily the best or most accurate way to do this. Passage number is not accurate because there can be big variability in how you and others passage yourselves. Say you split your 80% confluent cell culture at a 1 to 2 ratio during passaging. This means that your cells will undergo one doubling before they're ready to passage again. If, on the other round of passaging, you split your cells at a 1 to 4 ratio, then your cells will undergo two doublings before being ready to passage again mean they have undergone twice as many doublings as the previous passage. And if your lab mates split their cells at a higher ratio of 1 to 6 or even 1 to 10, those cells will have undergone even more doublings while still being technically the same passage number as your cells. The more cell division or doublings your cells undergo and the longer they spend in culture, which is the case if they're split at a higher ratio, then the more opportunity there is for genetic, phenotypic and cell population changes and drift. You may even notice changes in cell morphology over time. Given the problems outlined above, it may be preferable to keep a note of cell doubling numbers alongside passage numbers, as this may provide a more reliable way to avoid genetic and phenotypic changes from impacting your experiments and results. So that's it for understanding cell passage number. Check out the episode description for links to related articles and resources. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get more help and advice from mentors at your bench side.